Wheel of Gaming, no time to lose. Tell me the game I should choose. I'm just gonna remove this one myself. Don't worry, I'm just gonna spin it again. <clears throat> one last time. Wheel of Gaming, no joking around. Tell me the mind-blowing theory we've found. What? Internet. Welcome to Game Theory, where first, a special thank you to my friend Ryder Bergen, aka Foot of a Ferret, for composing that jazzy little intro. He's an up-and-coming creator that produces the series A Brief History here on YouTube, and he does incredible work. So show him some love and check him out. I would recommend the 2018 Year in Review episode. And while we're thanking people, a very special shout-out to Reddit and Tumblr theorist Dreamfisher for single-handedly putting Bendy and the Ink Machine back on my radar with some really fascinating observations. Trust me, I thought I was done with this game too, but we're back, and I gotta be honest, now that I've started digging through the game again, what I found completely upends a lot of what I thought I knew about Bendy's story. So let's not waste any more time because we got a lot to cover. It's time to dive back into the inky depths of Joey Drew Studios one more time. Before we get to things that got me to question some of my earlier conclusions about the game, let me first call out something that seemed to confirm one of the Bendy community's biggest fan theories, including a theory of our own. Hidden inside the game's files, there does appear to be confirmation that, at least at some point during the development process, Bendy was planned to be revealed as Joey Drew. Inspired by Dreamfisher's Reddit post covering their theory on a one-eyed Bendy, I did something I hadn't really done for any of the previous episodes. I dug specifically into the game's assets. Giving closer inspection to the 6,000 or so files used across the completed game's five chapters. Now, I have very, very limited experience with making games having only done a few rudimentary ones back in college. But one thing I do know is that it pays to be organized. For instance, in Bendy, you're dealing with 1,440 separate audio assets. So without any sort of clear labeling system, you're gonna be searching for a long time, or else you're suddenly gonna give Alice Angel some random ink splat sound effect instead of a voice. Luckily, Bendy's developers, The Meatly and Mike Mood, have done an excellent job of keeping all their files clearly labeled. All character voices are marked with DIA, for dialogue, followed by the chapter it's specifically being used in. But that's not all. Another titling convention they seemed to use for Chapter 5 was alternating titles in all caps based on the scene that it was in. Let me give you an example. As you go into the Sammy Lawrence battle early on in Chapter 5, all the audio clips for that section are in caps, like someone shouting for attention on Twitter. I trusted you. I gave you everything, and you left me to die. At the end of that Sammy fight, we enter a short cutscene with Alice and Boris, at which point all the file names go to lowercase. Oh, that was close. You're lucky we were in the neighborhood. Once the battle resumes with a new onslaught of searchers, we're back to uppercase. Watch out! Here they come! Go back to your puddles! Each segment of the battle is grouped based on its casing. Here's why this matters. In the files, the final boss fight against Bendy has Henry's one line. But he's never seen the end. The end. But there appears to be another unused line during that same segment, also listed all in caps. Joey? You notice the shock in Henry's voice as though he's surprised to see Joey. This then leads directly to a series of Beast Bendy audio files all in lowercase before going into Joey's final speech in the game's ending audio, which ends in caps. Joey underscore end. Henry, so soon. I didn't expect you for another hour yet. So the naming pattern still fits, but also, listen to the resonance. In designing the game, the team did an amazing job reflecting audio reverb to reflect the room scale that they're in. Large and full of echoes in the giant ink machine chamber. Set us free. A lot less open in the lower ceilings of Alice and Boris's hideout. Why are you here? And now compare the audio of the end with Joey's opening line in the kitchen. The end. Henry, so soon. The real-world audio with Joey Drew is much deader. There's no echo, no reverb, just like me when I record in the closet. But Henry's line of shock... Joey? The end. ...has that echo in there. An echo that appears for every single bit of dialogue that's said within the empty, sparse hallways of Joey Drew Studios. 
In short, the titling conventions and resonance tell us that Henry expresses his shock at seeing Joey sometime between the start of the final Bendy fight and going to Joey's apartment, thereby giving further evidence that Bendy is Joey, or at least was almost revealed to be Joey in unused audio files. So that was one of the first things to show up upon my closer inspection of the game, but here's where things go from moderately interesting to completely upending everything we thought we knew. Dreamfisher's post got me to specifically focus on the two textures used throughout the game, the stuff that wraps around 3D objects or environments to give them their detail. And in those files, you can find some pretty wacky stuff. Like this is Joey Drew as we knew him, and this is Joey Drew's face flattened by a steamroller. Look at that tongue just down there in the corner. And where are his eyes, you ask? <laughs> most effective jump scare this franchise has produced. In the actual game, you can't even see these things. Serious talk here though, Joey, you might want to look into getting some clear eyes. For dry red eyes. Clear eyes is awesome. But it's the very obviously titled texture pack named props 4 underscore shd hyphen mat hyphen underscore main text hyphen atlas zero that hides more secrets than I think any of us could have ever suspected. On this sheet, you have all the things that you'd expect to see around Joey Drew's little apartment here. Some paintings, a vase texture, the electrical outlets, evidence that Henry may actually be dead, a rug, you know, all the usual stuff. Now, I know what you're thinking. Those are truly enormous electrical plugs. I know, I was shocked too, but I really think that you're fixated on the wrong detail here. Cause like I said, hidden amongst that texture file is a series of newspaper headlines, one of which outright reads, local artist pushed himself too hard, found dead at desk. That's, um, an oddly specific newspaper headline to include in a game about a cartoon studio, right? What makes that headline even more suspicious, though, is when it's put in context with Joey's endgame speech. The truth is, you are always so good at pushing, old friend. Pushing me to do the right thing. You should have pushed a little harder. Again, we see this recurring theme of pushing and pushing harder. Coincidence? I definitely don't think so. I mean, if this newspaper headline were truly meant to be taken seriously and was referencing some event in the game's timeline, it would be directly referencing Henry, our artist, who specifically references his desk twice in the game. I hey, here's my old desk. I've wasted so much time in this chair. A character who, we also know based on his first and only audio log in the game, complains firsthand about just how hard he works. I haven't seen Linda for days now. When in doubt, just keep going, Henry. And here's the thing, we know this headline was specifically put in there by the game devs considering that we can see with some of the other newspaper textures that they've been clearly doctored. For instance, here, blank, a year in review. It was doctored to remove the year. These aren't just random assets that were thrown in for set dressing, they were selected, they were curated, they were corrected. It's also worth noting where in the game this headline exists, back near the ink machine in Joey Drew's apartment. You would never see this newspaper unless you hacked into the game in order to get over there. Which, let me tell you, is no small feat, but it is definitely there on a shelf in that back room. Joey collected the paper and keeps it next to his precious machine. But how could Henry be dead? We are obviously playing him walking around the studio. I hear you asking, and trust me, it's something that I kept asking myself as I wrote this thing too. Honestly, I don't know if this is anything more than just a suspicious easter egg thrown in there for hackers. But if it is real, I of course have a theory as to what's going on. And let me be completely honest with you, with a lot of the theories that I do on this channel, they're all just for fun. I don't necessarily believe every single one that we do, but in this case, I think I'm on to something. First, let's look at Joey's audio logs. In my final Bendy theory, I chose to focus on the thematic meaning of the ending, how it was a story of regrets, apologies, and closure in the real world. But in doing that, I largely wrote off events that were happening in the studio as just part of this story that Joey was telling. But what if there was a bit more truth to all this studio action than I originally expected? Consider this, throughout chapter five, Joey's audio logs give us a timeline of the development and usage of the ink machine. Whatever that great thing was, I saw him wandering around your office. You better keep it locked up tight. I realize it was a first attempt, but imagine if the press caught sight of it. If you claim that your failures are because these things are soulless, then damn it, we'll give them a soul. 
So the detail of the grin confirms for us that Bendy was indeed the first created and he's without a soul. Joey then, in his quest for a soul, moves on to former voice actress of Alice Angel, Susie Campbell. I know how much this part means to you, Susie. I too really believe my characters are more than just drawings. They're alive, Susie. I'll be straight. I'm putting together a small project, a little ceremony. I want you to bring Alice to life once again. What do you say? She says yes. So he uses the ink machine ritual to turn her into Alice Angel. And again and again for a lot of the other employees. This is why the walls of the studio are covered with the phrase, the creator lied to us. It's not because of salvation or anything like that, but it's because Joey lied. He lied like we see him do to Susie to get their souls sacrificed into his ink machine. Now look at this. Notice that there are two mutually exclusive sets of characters that we see over over the course of the game. One set has coffins hidden inside the studio, and the other set have letters on Joey True's bulletin board. With the coffins, we have Susie Campbell, Bertram Piedmont, Grant Cohen, Norman Polk, and Lacey Benton. With letters on the bulletin board, we have Wally Franks, Allison Pendle, and Thomas Connor. The ones with coffins are actually in those coffins. Those are the victims in real life. They are soulless. They are dead. Empty husks of bodies. Sacrificed to the machine. All the others, in the words of Wally Franks, were out of there and are now living happy lives far away from Joey and his machine. Seems like a lot to assume, but I have proof. Look at this. It's an incredibly small but super important detail. In Chapter 4, we fight and defeat Bertram Piedmont. Look what happens at the end of his battle. His head remains intact, but the doors shut on him. Now look at what happens when Susie's form of Alice Angel dies. She just lays there. Dead. But what about Frank and Boris just moments before? The game makes sure that we see that he melts away into the ink. That is the difference here. One set of characters is made out of just ink and melt away as soon as they're defeated. The other set have actual human souls in them and don't fade away. You have two chances to see Norman the Projectionist die. Once in Chapter 3 and again in Chapter 4 to the hands of Bendy. In both cases, Norman's body persists. He lies on the ground if you take him out, or he's dragged away by Bendy if he's the one who does the deed. Those creatures, the one with souls actually infused into them, are all the ones associated with coffins. So what does any of this have to do with Henry and a newspaper headline about an artist dying? It tells us that Henry got tricked. That Joey successfully sacrificed him to the ink machine. I mean, think about it. He got a letter from Joey Drew in inviting him back to the studio in much the same way that Joey reached out to all of his former employees. Those letters on Joey's bulletin board, what I originally interpreted as Joey reaching out trying to make amends to his former employees, is actually just evidence that he tried to lure everyone back to the office to sacrifice him to the machine, and that some people, like Allison, Tom, and Wally, just lucked out. They lived far enough away to take a meeting with their former boss, said thanks, but no thanks. But that other people, like Susie, Bertram, and now Henry said yes to the invite and became victims. What about that final scene between Henry and Joey? It's actually told out of sequence. That's actually the first scene of our little timeline. It shows that Henry went to meet Joey, and now listen to what Joey says. The truth is, you are always so good at pushing, old friend. Pushing me to do the right thing. You should have pushed a little harder. That's him admitting that he's still bad. I mean, translating that line, it's basically, you pushed me to be better, but you didn't push enough. Need more proof? Remember at the end of the Tombstone Picnic cartoon where Bendy sees a human shadow? Well, look a bit closer at that scene and you'll notice that in the final frames, we see Bendy smile. It's not a reaction of fear or mischief, it's him smiling at his creator, Henry. And that's not all. On a second playthrough, we have the ability to use the lens of truth, which reveals hidden messages written on the walls throughout the studio. We established during the last Bendy theory that those messages were left by Henry, as evidenced by lines like, that's the Joey I knew, and his dream, my effort. But it's the invisible line of Joey lied to us that shows that even Henry, at this point in the game, recognizes that he was betrayed by his former business partner. Remember those weird flashbacks at the end of chapter one? Well, they happen when Henry steps into the sacrifice circle. And what do we see? Joey's wheelchair 
wheelchair from a ground up perspective. That is us on the ground looking up at Joey's wheelchair. We also see the ink machine and Bendy. We are flashing back to the moment when Henry first got sacrificed, knocked onto the ground looking up at Joey's wheelchair. But the clincher here is in the lead up to the final battle against Bendy. We see Boris, Allison, and Henry come to the ink machine one final time. But before they can enter it, they have to cross an inky river. And it's here that Allison and Boris have to get left behind, saying this. I don't see any way around. We're not like you, Henry. If we go in there, well, a drop of water in the ocean is rarely seen again. Again, Allison and Boris here are supposed to be Allison, Pendle, and Thomas Connor, but Joey hasn't been able to get a hold of their souls. We see as much because they wrote a note to him on the bulletin board. As such, they're only ink creatures. Good ones, to be sure, but still, they're just ink. That's why they can't cross the river while Henry can. In the end, Henry accepts Joey's invite. 30 years after he left the studio, Joey leads Henry to the machine, does the ritual, and sends Henry's soul into a character, leaving behind the empty husk of Henry's body to be disposed of. Not in a coffin like the others, but left at a desk. An artist slumped over his work, reported dead from pushing too hard. And why would Joey do this? Well, maybe, unlike his other victims, Henry has a family. A family who'd be curious if he one day went missing. Meanwhile, Henry's soul is left wandering the film reels, an animated purgatory over and over again, alongside the characters that he helped create that were turned into monsters by the man who betrayed them all. It couldn't be further in tone from the initial ending that I proposed for this game, but I gotta say, in my mind, it ties up a whole lot more loose ends. Like I said, has a pretty good shot at being true. Maybe not this end bit about disposing the body and things like that, but I think a lot of the stuff leading up to it makes sense. The Meatly, Mike Mood, if you're watching this, or if the theorists who watch this send this to you, are we closer this time? I'd be curious. I know news is coming out about a new project for you guys. Can't wait to see it. You know I'll be here waiting to theorize. In the meantime, remember, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. As I was researching for this episode, I came across a lot more theory fodder for Bendy. Surprisingly, actually, a lot of stuff that I haven't seen covered anywhere else. So make sure that you hit that subscribe button to be informed of when those theories happen. There is shockingly more Bendy in the works. And with a new project from the Meatly and Mike Moog coming down the pipeline, you know that we are going to be there to theorize. Make sure you subscribe to be there for it. And heck, if you want to see my completely opposite Bendy ending theory, click the box you see on screen right now. So now, if you'll excuse me, I'll see you guys next week.